going to talk about Christmas for the next few weeks, new series here. You know, I think every preacher struggles with, okay, how do I take this ageless word that I speak every year on, and how do I make it a little bit fresh, and I'm no exception to that. You know, it is actually important to me that I speak what's on God's heart for God's people, but when there's a text that predictably comes up, I mean, you know, we're doing a Christmas series, so guess what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks? <laughs> And so uh, I asked the Lord, uh, give me something that's fresh from heaven for God's people. And I feel like he did this morning, so I'm kind of excited to get this series started here. So in the Bible, we have four accounts of Jesus' life. And uh, at Christmas time, we preachers predictably speak from either Matthew or Luke. And the reason for that is that if you take a look at uh, Mark's gospel or John's gospel, the other two of the four, both of those accounts basically begin with the ministry of John the Baptist. It's actually only Matthew and Luke that start off with the birth of Jesus. So predictably, those are the the gospel accounts that you begin with. Luke begins the Christmas narrative with the angel coming to the mother of Jesus' cousins, who would be the mother of John the Baptist. The angel also comes to Mary herself and announces that she, Mary, is going to give birth to the Son of God. That's Luke's gospel. But Matthew's gospel account in the beginning is a very unique one, and the reason what makes it unique is that instead of starting with the story of Jesus coming into the earth, he begins instead with a genealogy. In fact, when you read the Christmas story, most of us have skipped over chapter one of Matthew, and that's because the whole chapter is a genealogy, and if we're honest, we skip over that kind of stuff because, well, we don't really understand the point, it's boring, and frankly, we don't really care. I mean, let's face it, how many of us have skipped over genealogies? Yeah, I predictably too, like blah, 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 and I move on to where something there's, I can use there, you know? And so in our culture, genealogies are a bit irrelevant. We don't think much about them. But in the culture of ancient Israel, especially when it concerns the topic of the coming Messiah, actually genealogy was a pretty big deal. And so let me show you how Matthew begins. Eventually he gets to the Christmas story, but he begins first of all like this. He says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And he starts right there because Matthew is speaking primarily to Jewish people. And he's going to speak about the birth of their Messiah. And every Jew grew up in synagogue, knew right away that if you're going to talk about the Messiah, two things. He better be related to David. He better be related to Abraham. If those are not in the mix, it's game over. Whoever this person you're talking about is not our Messiah. So Matthew, writing again primarily to Jewish people, he starts right there. Let's get those two big names on the table right away so that I will have your attention. And then it goes on, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob. Okay, how many of you are already feeling the sleepiness coming over you? You know, that's what genealogies kind of do to you. Father of Isaac, Isaac's the father of Jacob. He's beginning with Abraham, kind of working down the line here. Jacob is the father of Judah and his brothers. And even the mention of Judah, well, we'll talk about that one a little bit next week. So he goes on and on and on. He begins with Abraham, follows his genealogy all the way through to Jesus. And again, not really all that interesting, and you wonder why he would do that. And again, I think it's because he's wanting to make the case that this Jesus is the Son of God, this Jesus is the Messiah. And so he's gonna make sure that David and Abraham get mentioned in the mix. And then he does something that's pretty unexpected, actually quite unusual in this genealogy. It's a genealogy that should have been primarily, if not exclusively, male-dominated. Because in ancient times, really, it was the men who carried the seed, if you will. It was the men whose lineage that mattered. In fact, fathers were really the only thing that mattered when it came to lineage. And then Matthew does this very unlikely thing where he begins now to mention women. In fact, there are four women, to be exact. And he actually pauses as if to highlight these four women. Women that if you and I were writing this, this genealogy, 
These are four women that we would have absolutely left out because if the point is to show that Jesus is from divine lineage, if that's the point of having this genealogy, the mention of these four women actually gets in the way and it disrupts the flow of what Matthew is trying to accomplish here. It actually adds confusion to mention women, period, and specifically these four women. But here's why this is important, though. In ancient times, the only history that was recorded, especially during this time period, but really all history prior to this time period, history was written primarily by hired historians. They were the people who captured what was going on. I say hired because, well, It was actually provided, the people who were hired were, uh, who, who did the hiring, were actually kings or emperors or military leaders. They were the ones who hired the historians, someone to write their version of what happened during their leadership. And generally speaking, they hired people to write histories who, well, (laughs) who were hired to make the leader look good. Ancient history has that common denominator, but the problem with this, of course, is that if the deal is to make it look good, well, then the historical account actually has some gaps in it because they made a big deal out of their military victories while downplaying their military defeats. They made a big deal of their sons, these kings, these emperors, these military leaders. Big deal of what their sons did, who were warriors, highlighting their sons' successes, skipping over their less than stellar battles that took place. Sometimes sons aren't mentioned at all in ancient history because that son really had no notable contribution in battle. And the point is, the little history we have of ancient times has always written has always been written with a bias, has always been written with a slant designed to give the most favorable view of the person being talked about in the historical account. So when we come back to Matthew's historical account, Matthew goes out of his way not to make Jesus look good, but to make the audience actually question some of the people in Jesus' genealogy, I mean, he mentions people that he really didn't need to mention at all. Most notably, these four women. And again, it should have been just men. So here's the deal. Three of the four women aren't even Jewish. And again, you step back, you go, why, Matthew? You're writing to Jewish people. Why would you create that kind of confusion? Two of the women he mentions really should not have been mentioned at all because their stories are anything but stellar. There's no point in making these. These women did not make anybody look good. Far from it. And so Matthew goes out of his way to state that your Messiah does not come from a pure bloodline. And so let's look at the first woman, Uh, verse 3. Judah, which, even the mention of Judah is like, okay, why did we go with that brother of the 12? Might have been better off with using Joseph. You know, Joseph's story has more in Scripture than any single character in all of Scripture. And if there's ever a person who sort of reflected and was a symbol or a type of Jesus, it would be Joseph. Judah, by contrast, has one chapter, and believe me, that chapter about Judah If I were to share that in the pulpit, there are things that I would have to be editing out that I could not say in this room because we have children in this room. So he chooses Judah, of all people, and a part of that has to do with this first woman, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And again, Tamar is mentioned here. I've said many times the Bible speaks the truth even when the truth is ugly. (laughs) And of all the ugly stories in Scripture, the mention of Tamar would be near the top of the list. The story of Tamar is really one of those dark stories that is so sordid that it's actually embarrassing to talk about in a teaching perspective. It's one of those stories that the original audience would blush, as well as every generation following, I know all of you are taking that. Okay, go home, research Tamar. What was that story all about? (laughs) Got your curiosity going now, don't I? (laughs) Yeah, 
I'm not going to talk about Tamar. Let's move on. <laughs> Ram, the father of Medinadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Whose mother was Rahab. Throws in another non-Jewish woman. Rahab had a nickname, didn't she? Rahab the... Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, this is when we all get to heaven. We're gonna meet Rahab and go, "Hey, you're Rahab, the 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 lady in the Old Testament." Uh, <laughs> Again, no reason to bring up this woman. No reason whatsoever. We go on, verse five. Boaz, the father of Bo- of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, Ruth is a good story. In fact, there's an entire Bible uh, book that is devoted to the story of Ruth. Um, but listen, here's the deal with Ruth: is that she was not Jewish. She was a Moabite. She was from Moab. And I know when I mention a Moab. All of you are thinking immediately of when Moses looked out over the promised land that he wasn't allowed to look on, and he was on Mount Nebo in the land of Moab. I know all of you are thinking that right now, right? Being that she was a Moabite. Yeah, right. And for a Jew thinking, again, why mention her? She's not even Jewish. Matthew, you're trying to connect Jesus to divine lineage. Why all these off-ramps? Why all of this distraction? We go on. Obed, the father of Jesse, verse 6. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. (laughs) We get to David finally. But he goes right past David, who's sort of the key person, brief reference to him, and adds this drama. Intentionally drawing attention to this story, creating drama, by not even mentioning her name. Now, all of you Bible scholars, tell me, who was the mother of Solomon? Bathsheba, Bathsheba, that's right. Uh, Matthew doesn't just quickly mention her by name. No, he, he creates this intrigue the way he writes it. Solomon's mother, you know, who was another man's wife. Solomon's mother, who was one of David's good friend's wife. Solomon's mother, uh, who was one of his leader's wives, whom David had killed to cover up his adultery. (laughs) It's like the worst experience in all of David's life, and Matthew goes out of his way to highlight this. I mean, he could have said, Jesse, the father of King David, who slew Goliath. He could have said, David was the father of Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived. That's what he could have said. Highlighted something good in Solomon's life. But no, Solomon, whose mother had had been Uriah's wife, He's just twisting the knife now. And so again, we've raised the question, Matthew, why all the distraction? Why not just stick with the men? Matthew, why don't you point out the good? Why are you highlighting low points in these people's lives? Or if you're going to mention women at all, why these women? How about if we mention people like Sarah? Or better than Sarah, how about Rebecca? Rebecca's a cool story of ancient women from Jewish heritage? Why not Abigail? Why these women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the mother of Solomon, who was another man's wife? Why? And I think I know why. I think it's because Jesus, because Matthew had spent three years with Jesus. Matthew saw Jesus die on a cross. Matthew stood next to an empty tomb. I think Matthew knew all about these shady characters, their baggage, all their sin, their embarrassing stories. He knew all about that. He grew up in synagogue. But I think they were included because Matthew knew they were the point of the story that he was about to tell. People like this were actually the point of the story. Matthew knew that sin would be the issue, and Jesus came to earth to address 
that issue. Matthew knew that this was really a story about light coming into the darkness. Matthew knew that this was a story about life overcoming death. Matthew knew that this was a story about grace, accomplishing what keeping the law could never accomplish. Matthew knew that this was a story of forgiveness in a world that only knew condemnation. Matthew knew that this was a story of glad tidings for all people, even people who have a past, even people whose character is less than stellar. Maybe the reason Matthew threw in all these characters with seedy stories was because for Matthew, this was also his story. (laughs) In other words, Tamar, Rahab, David and Bathsheba, these were his kind of people, the kind of people that were his friends, actually. Matthew could identify more with these four women and some of the men like Judah. He could identify more with them than the other patriarchs of the faith because Matthew's background was not one of high integrity. He knew all about a life marked by embarrassment, a life marked by disgrace, a life marked by humiliation. And so the first time that Matthew met Jesus, it was in a region called Capernaum, which was a port town of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is actually just a lake, but it's such a large lake that it actually creates its own weather system at times when certain climate factors are right. It can be a tumultuous sea-like body of water. And Capernaum was one of these little coastal communities And there's a man who is carried as Jesus arrives in Capernaum, having crossed this Sea of Galilee. Wherever Jesus went, he healed people. And somehow people knew that he had just arrived. And so a group of friends carried a friend who had been paralyzed. And in the course of that setting, There in Capernaum, instead of Jesus just instantly healing his paralysis, instead he did something that was quite remarkable. He did something that was very upsetting to the religious elite. Instead of saying, hey, get up and rise and walk, he said instead, son, your sins are forgiven, which to the Jewish mind was paramount to blasphemy because they knew that God and God alone forgave sins. And Jesus wielded authority not just to heal sick and to cure paralysis, but to forgive sins as well. And Matthew is in Capernaum. We don't know if he was actually in on that initial setting. I mean, this might have taken place actually still on the dock after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, or maybe they had just le- left the, dark, the dock and they're still in the parking lot of the, uh, of the port community there. But what we do know is that this man was carried to Jesus. There was these words that were exchanged about forgiveness of sins, And the man who arrived paralyzed walked away carrying his mat under his own power. The very first time Jesus and Matthew met took place in Capernaum immediately on the heels of this experience. Again, don't know if if uh, if he was if Matthew was actually there or not. But what we do know is that in a matter of moments, Matthew was quite aware of what had just taken place there. And so the first time they meet, Matthew captures his own story as Jesus went on from there, there being that setting where the paralyzed man was healed. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Here's Matthew, his first encounter with Jesus. I mean, really, you ever gone to a party and you play the tell your most embarrassing moment game? Uh, This would be, I think, Matthew's most embarrassing moment. This was his story. Matthew knows Jesus. 
is at the dock. A group of men have met him there, carried a sick guy in. That sick guy is walking away, carrying his mat. Jesus moves toward me, and before I know it, I'm face to face with this man called Jesus while I'm sitting in the chair of my tax office. And the reason why this is so embarrassing is that the Roman government had sold rights to certain people to collect tax from Roman citizens. You could go to Rome, you could acquire a certificate that gave you the authority to collect those taxes. There was a certain amount that Rome wanted, and your pay was basically to charge whatever additional you think you can get away with. Whatever additional you would like was up to you. And so Matthew has this certificate empowering him to collect, and the way it worked was that the tax collector He collected Rome's tax and then added his own surcharge. And so tax collectors, they they became actually very, very wealthy. They were among the richest people in any community during this time period. And they got rich on the backs of their fellow countrymen. Everyone else, of course, was poor because in this system, there were countless taxes. So everybody's poor because Rome has got such a deep cut. I mean, there's income taxes, there's toll tax taxes, there's bridge taxes, there's gate taxes, there's port taxes. There was a tax on almost everything that you did. And anytime Rome needed more money, they just upped their tax rate. And so Matthew's certificate, which by the way was usually issued for about a five-year time period. We don't know how long Matthew's been doing this, but because he has wealth, we know he's been doing it for a little while. Maybe the five years is about to expire. Maybe he's already done five years and then renewed his certification to collect taxes. That part we're not sure about. But what we do know is that he was not popular among the Jews, this Matthew. He had betrayed his God, betrayed his nation, betrayed his community. So any Jew who held this certificate to collect taxes was the most despised person in the community, the lowest on the totem pole in the social rankings. And there's many places in Scripture that refer to, when speaking of broken, sinful people, they're described as sinners and or tax collectors. So the tax collector, man, they got their own category of sinfulness. They were actually below sinners. They were below notorious sinners. They were the worst of the worst. And this is Matthew. He sits in his shameful tax office, and then Jesus approaches him. And he says, follow me. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and he followed. And so I picture Matthew, when Jesus says, follow me, it's like, (laughs) even though Jesus is looking right at him, he's looking like, okay, he must be speaking to somebody else. We're looking for somebody behind him who he might have been chatting with there. Uh, Not only that, I picture the other disciples thinking, Jesus, listen, We've got a good gig going on over here. We've already got a whole bunch of people extremely upset about that forgiveness of sin thing that happened just a moment ago. And listen, you're about to ruin everything that's taking place here because now you're inviting this guy to join us? Listen, you're going to make everybody run if they see Matthew with us. I'm picturing that taking place in the background. Jesus, you've got to be kidding. But Matthew, realizing it was, you know what? He's actually inviting me. There's nobody behind me here. He's inviting me to come. Matthew agrees. And apparently, as he begins to follow Jesus, leaves behind his tax business, the first stop is apparently Matthew's house. And along the way, Jesus says, hey, listen, by the way, let's go have a meal at your house. And how about if you invite some of your friends to join us. So again, remember, he's completely ostracized by the community. The only friends he has are other sinners and other tax collectors. And so they go to Matthew's house and they have dinner. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came. Again, those were the friends that Matthew had, the only friends that he had. And they ate with him and with his disciples. In a culture steeped in self-righteousness, I'm telling you, this was over the top. You and I look at that and go, okay, 
little bit of a tidbit, a little bit of a detail. I'm not quite sure how all that's relevant. Who cares? But to the original audience hearing Matthew's account, this was huge that Jesus is sitting down eating with a group of people like this. All the religious elite in the area at that time, because of the hubbub about authority to forgive sins and the blasphemy accusation, as well as the guy who was carried in, crippled, and now walks away, the religious elite, they come and they gather, but they're not going inside because they don't dare go inside Matthew's house. I mean, if they did that, it would take them months to become ceremonially clean, to be able to go back into the temple or back into the synagogue. They'd never be able to really go inside the temple again. These tax collectors, these sinners, really, man, they had some kind of special cooties that floated in the air, and the religious elite just stayed away from them because they might get contaminated by these type of people. And so they motioned to some of the disciples, you know, peering through the windows, hey, come here. I need to talk to you. And they bring in some of the disciples outside from Matthew's house, verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, this being Jesus eating with this particular group of people, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You know, they're like, we are so confused about your rabbi. Because on one hand, he does these miracles that really only somebody who walks with God can do that. But then he turns around and says things like, your sins are forgiven, which sort of is a terminology in the talk of a blasphemer. You know, he seems to uh, be respectful of God's laws and never speaks evil of Moses and, and the law of Moses. But on the other hand, he breaks rules all the time. We're just confused about your rabbi here is what they're saying. It's a mystery to us. It's a contradiction. We just don't get it. I think Jesus overhears this conversation between the religious elite and his disciples. And so he comes out and here's what he says. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Now, how many of you know that Matthew and his buddies could have taken offense to that? Hey, it's the healthy who need a physician. I mean, it's not the healthy, but it's the sick who need a physician. I mean, you know, if I came at you and judged you about being sick and not healthy, judged you about being a sinner or not, you know, really, you could absolutely tell me, you know, where to go, you know, with my God talk and, you know, where to put my God talk. You, you could do all of that. I get that. But here they are, and I guess when Jesus said it, they have not taken offense to what Jesus said here. They weren't. And I'm pretty sure I know why they didn't take offense to what Jesus said. Here's the deal. You should know this, that people who are far from God know that they're far from God. I mean, I can remember this as a 17-year-old kid 45 years ago. I remember well when the gospel was presented to me that I needed to confess my sins, that I needed to ask God for forgiveness, I needed to appropriate the work that Christ had done on the cross for my sins. None of that was alarming to me. There wasn't a single shred of me that was thinking, what sins? There wasn't one piece of me that was thinking, you know, you don't really know me. I, God and I are tight, you know? I mean, there wasn't one little bit of me that was thinking that. To the contrary, I knew to the core of my being that I was far from God. And you know how I knew? Because I was far from God. And I propose that everybody who's far from God, even though they may get defensive, underneath that defensive, they're not going to argue the point. They know that they're far from God. And Matthew knew it too. He may not have th thought of it in terms of being sick, but he knew he wasn't righteous. <laughs> he knew he wasn't close to God. He knew. And remember, this is all Jesus and Matthew's very first encounter together. And so Jesus ends this conversation and he says, go and learn what this means. 
And now he quotes from a, a fabulous story that I'm not gonna take any time to address this morning, but it's one of the coolest stories in the Bible. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then Jesus, speaking no longer of the quote from the Old Testament, now just speaking from his own heart, he says, for I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinner. In other words, Jesus, why did you come? Not for the well, not for the righteous. I came for the sick. I came for the sinners. And you see, when Matthew considered his own story, his gospel account, he knew that to include sinners in his genealogy, that wasn't an aberration. That wasn't an exception. No, it was the point. It was the point. Because he had seen Jesus live out this statement that I have come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. He'd seen Jesus live that out. He'd seen Jesus live out, I've not come for the healthy, but for the sick. For three years he walked with Jesus and he saw that lived out every day. And Matthew knew probably more than any of the other gospel writers that the story of Christmas, the story of Jesus, is ultimately, next slide, God drawing near to those who had drawn away. That's ultimately the story of Christmas, and Matthew knew that. God drawing near to those who had been drawn away. The story of Christmas is about leaning in towards those who had leaned away from God, about God pursuing those who had distanced themselves from God, distance themselves from God for a whole bunch of reasons. Maybe they've been disappointed in life. Maybe they've been hurt by religion. Maybe they just lacked knowledge. A million other reasons people found themselves distant from God. And Matthew understood he needed to highlight the problems in the genealogy because the misfits re reflected why Jesus came. And at the end of three years following Jesus, here's what Matthew discovered. That Jesus had changed the rules about approaching God. That before Jesus, Matthew's thinking was that in order to approach God, it would have to be based on the idea and founded on the idea of what I have done. Before Jesus, that was the idea of approaching God. What I've done, or maybe what I've not done, is the basis, it's the foundation of how one can approach God. And this is what Matthew grew up with. The belief that if I do good, God will hear my prayers. If I do good, he'll bless my crops. If I do good, he'll give me lots of children. If I do good, God will accept me. And it's no wonder that Matthew had formerly distanced from God because he didn't have a leg to stand on. The old rule was that in order to approach God, I've got to do good and not do bad, and Matthew was disqualified, and therefore he had no approach to God. What Matthew discovered after following Jesus, though, after seeing him hang on a cross, after witnessing the empty tomb, was that he... Matthew could now approach God on the merit, not of what I've done, but now on the basis of what he, Jesus, has done. That's the new term for approaching God. And again, Matthew, more than any of the disciples, I think, benefited by the rules changing <laughs> because his own personal righteous didn't make the grade and much like some of the people that Matthew included in his genealogy, his past, Matthew's past, it was seedy, it was flawed. As a former tax collector, he was not going to make the grade relying on his own righteousness. So it makes perfect sense that he would include the unexpected in his genealogy because they were the point of Jesus coming. 
Jesus had not come for those who felt they had a standing before God based on their own righteousness. Those weren't the folks that Jesus came for. for. But for those who knew they had no leg to stand on before a holy and a just God. Jesus had come for those who knew they needed a Savior and not for those who do well, but for those who needed mercy, who needed a gift, who needed the gift of righteousness. So as Matthew writes his genealogy, I actually picture him smiling. I see him grinning. It was like a temptation that was just too much for him to resist. You know, he's got options about how he's going to lay down this genealogy. I could go with Joseph here, but I'm going to go with Judah instead. You know, I could mention Rebecca. But let's do Tamar instead. <laughs> I picture him just grinning while he's putting it the way he does. So, as we approach Christmas, Living Hope, a couple of thoughts on application. If you're here and you're not a Christ follower, you know, you're intrigued, which I'm guessing would be why you might be here this morning, but if you're not a Christ follower, here's an application from Matthew's story that's for you, that you're invited to follow Jesus regardless of your past. Because whatever past you have, I assure you, it didn't compare to Matthew's. And truth be known, it probably doesn't compare to mine. In fact, truth be known, it doesn't compare to a lot of living hopers. (laughs) All right, let's be honest, living hope. How many of us have have a past? See what I mean? No one comes to God based on their own righteousness or goodness. You can come to God because of what Jesus did for you. And then if you are a Christ follower, what's the takeaway this morning from this story? Simply, keep your focus on what Jesus did for you. Because I'm not sure what it is. There's just something about the inclination that we start this journey by grace. We start this journey not on our own righteousness. We're grateful that sins, past, present, and future have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. We understand the message of grace. We embrace it and we begin this journey on grace. But there's something along the way where we kind of forget about grace and then in the process of conformity to Christ's image, in the process of becoming more like him, we seem to think that a little bit of human effort and human righteousness is a part of the process. We forget And actually, that stuff gets in the way of what God's trying to do in our life. So if you are a Christ follower, this would be a good time to say, okay, enough of that kind of self-righteous stuff, enough of that human effort stuff, coming back to the message of grace, coming back to the message of what he has done for me. It's what saved me in the beginning. What he has done for me is what opens the door for any resource from heaven that I need to grow up, any resource from heaven that I need to be healthy in my, in my marriage, any resource from heaven I need to be healthy towards my children, to be healthy in the neighborhood, healthy in the workplace, all that I need comes from God's grace. And we just need to keep our focus that it began based on what he did and it continues every single day based on what he did. Father, thank you so much for Matthew's account. It gives hope to me. Like Matthew, Lord, I have to say that the characters in his genealogy are the ones that I might more relate to than all the good people that are mentioned. I thank you that you're a friend to broken people. I thank you that you revealed and demonstrated your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I pray for the one here that maybe has never invited you into their life, Lord. I pray that they would understand the hope of Matthew's story and they would say yes to a journey with you, yes to following you, yes to surrendering their life to you. And I pray for the rest of us, Lord, that as we continue on in this walk that we have with you, that we hold on to grace, that we hold on to what you have done for us, 
and we put no confidence in our own flesh. Pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.